My name is Karina Tunnell. I am indeed at Max4, and uh, I've given my title, um, the, my talk, the title "Bioimaging at Max4 uh, underscore the Bare Bones," because um, I want to talk to you a little bit using one of the articles that has recently come out that uses quite a number of different techniques that you can do at synchrotrons uh, and at Max4 in particular um, as a sort of like guideline uh, throughout the the talk. Uh, I will, of course, I will start with a very, very short introduction to synchrotron basics uh, and a little bit about bones for those of you who do other types of research, like me, I'm a physicist, um, before we then move into the different techniques and the different beam lines uh, to explain a little bit what, what you can look at with these beam lines. Mind you, I use bones in this example simply because that was the article that I could find that had most techniques in it. But it doesn't mean that these techniques only work for bones. They also work in a number of cases for cells or for uh, tissue samples, for instance. Right, so without further ado, let's have a look at the synchrotron. So the MAX4 synchrotron is, uh, in a way, you could say unique because we have two rings, not just one. And in a synchrotron, what you typically do is you accelerate electrons to a certain given energy, in our case 1.5 for the smaller ring, 3 GV for the bigger ring, using a linear accelerator or a LINAC, uh, which is basically uh, AC fields of electrical uh, force. And then once you put them into the ring, of course, they have to stay there and go round instead. Um, and that we do mostly with magnets. So um, whenever an electron, a fast moving electron, goes through a magnetic field, as illustrated on the right, I don't know, let's see if I can, can you see my mouse pointer as well? Um, I just assume you can. Um, so when an electron goes through a magnetic field, it gets a force uh, acted upon it, and it will therefore change its path a little bit. And at the same time, because you're changing the, the radial velocity, it will send out light. It's like going with a car through a corner and then um, uh, skidding a little bit and the screeching of the tires you can take as the photons. So within this magnetic uh, lattice, now the electrons are captured. And the other unique thing about the uh, MAX4 synchrotron is that in the 3 GV specifically, rather than having these blocky magnets that you can see here on the right, the uh, individual magnets that bend are actually split up in um, in seven different pieces. So it's a seven bend acromat, as it is called. And the reason for that is that uh, it makes the bend a little bit more gentle. It keeps the electron better together, let's say. And then uh, the light that comes out is more focused. It's more like a laser. And you may have heard this, that uh, it is considered one of these fourth generation um, synchrotrons, which means that we are uh, giving more coherent, more brilliant light than before. Now, of course, this light that we want to work with, that is the, the product that we eventually use to put onto the sample. And in order for that to co come onto the sample in a very intense way, we use at the beginning of each beam line another type of magnetic structure uh, called an insertion device. Uh, these are subdivided in undulators and wigglers. Um, the distinction is not very important for this, but it basically, it makes the, the electron slalom locally and then uh, more light is produced that goes down into the beam line. So you basically have a collection of these smaller magnets before the electron is taken further down into the ring. So then the other thing we need to know about a little bit is the beam lines. And uh, the beam lines are roughly divisible into hard X-ray and soft X-ray beam lines, where I would say for the photons that we look at, the distinction is a bit below 2000 EV electron volt, uh, I would call it soft, and above that I would call it hard. Um, but the distinction is not very, uh, very important. It has some implications, of course, for which techniques and which uh, materials can be studied, but we will see that um, as we go on. So now the main purpose of the beam line is to focus the light onto the sample. So we have mirrors for that, that we use at a very glancing angle. So very small, shallow angles. We have a thing that is called a monochromator. They are a little bit different as well for soft and hard X-ray beam lines, but they do the same thing. They select an energy or a wavelength that is needed for the experiment later on. Then the third ingredient that we have are slits and apertures that are used to cut away any of the light that we don't want. 
And then finally, we can put the sample into this, uh, the, the beam that is left over that has the right energy and uh, the right fixtures. So in essence, you can take in principle any light and play with it, but by using the pinholes, by using the exit slit to cut away everything that you don't want and make it small, you increase the spatial coherence. With a monochromator, you can uh, select the right energy and combined monochromator and exit slit will give you a nice uh, coherent and monoenergetic beam. The thing about Max 4 is that because the light already at the beginning is more coherent um, than ever before, you get also more light onto the sample of a good quality. Right, so that's it for um, synchrotrons and beam lines. So looking at Max 4, you see now in real size the small ring, the 1.5 GV ring, and the big ring, the 3 GV ring and the beam lines that at the moment uh, are present, or in certain cases, if they have a dotted line, that are thought of and hopefully at some point will come there. Now in green, I have circled the beam lines that do some form of bioimaging or have the capacity to do bioimaging. Um, and in orange and blue, I now add um, other beam lines that do imaging, for instance, Max Beam and Danmax, but they don't really care um, so much for um, biological samples. They're a little bit more geared towards physics samples. And then we have the beam lines that definitely do work with a lot of bio um, samples, like the cr protein crystallography beam lines, for instance, uh, but they don't really do imaging. So I will mostly talk about the green beam lines here that you can see on the screen. So now a little bit about the bones. So the paper that I told you that I was going to use as a, um, a guideline throughout the talk. And if there's any bone experts listening, I'm sure that you will correct me on many things. Uh, and I've tried my best to understand uh, the physics, uh, the, sorry, the biology of it uh, from a physics perspective. So in the article, they use um, many techniques to look at the, um, the development of bone in uh, an embryonic uh, form of a mouse. So, and specifically at the, at the arm of the, of the mouse, so this bone, bone here, um, during the last couple of days of, uh, uh, of pregnancy, you could say, so the last days of the embryo, they follow it from the cartilage template that it starts with, all the way to the fact that it actually uh, is making complex bone. And they do this on a number of hierarchical levels, so from the macroscopic scale to a more nanotype scale, using these different techniques at the synchrotron. So, and then the kind of process that is governed by this is called endochondral ossification, where it starts with um, um, the cartilage template and it slowly develops into a bone. So, what happens is that um, somewhere around this area, um, it will start to grow outward, this, uh, this ossification center, and it means that slowly but surely the cartilage is replaced by hydroxyapatite uh, layers containing calcium that gives the strength in a particular rather complex structure that gives the hardness along the load direction so that you can actually use uh, the arm for something. So, and then from their article, I have the following picture where they look at the, um, the humerus bone and they look at the different uh, stages where they look for the hydroxyapatite to form and uh, attach itself uh, in ways that the collagen fibril takes over for, for strength. And then they have all of these techniques here down below. So then let's have a look um, for uh, the techniques. And I can, I can tell you now that if we do imaging, usually we combine it with one of these two uh, methods, either spectroscopy or diffraction methods. And that is to give us the contrast. So the imaging itself is basically a way of visualizing what we have, but we either do that using uh, the structure of the sample and using diffraction or scattering methods, or we do it using the spectroscopy. So basically the chemistry of the sample. And that means usually something moves in energy. It's either a detector that has uh, energy resolved or uh, you move the monochromator to give different wavelengths. Whereas on this side, it is usually, uh, you have a 2D detector that catches different diffractions uh, or different um, scattering parameters of the sample 
in a wider 2D picture. So I'm going to start off with the, the bottom one. Um, so the structural part to combine with uh, imaging and uh, the choice to, to look at the macroscopic scale that they made is uh, using x-ray tomography, which basically means you have x-rays that you shine through and at the same time you rotate the sample so that you get images from your sample from all places. Now, uh, x-rays and scanning through uh, a sample, we of course know when we have to go to the doctor for an x-ray, but uh, combining it with the rotational element, it gives you a 3D uh, view of the sample. And here at Max4, we have in principle three ways of doing this. So we have a full field method where you start with a parallel beam that encompasses the whole sample, as it were, and uh, you basically project it onto uh, a detector behind it. So that is the easiest way because it works using absorption. So basically there is a sample in the way and therefore less beam will be seen in the middle here where the sample is in the way and the amount uh, of sample plus the character of the sample, so whether it's a light element or a heavy element, will mean that there is differences in contrast here, simply due to the absorption. This can be done at a beamline called Formax, which is currently in development. It's being built as we speak. Then the next thing uh, that we can also do is again in full field, but rather than just looking at the uh, absorption contrast, we look at the phase contrast. And what does that mean? Well, if you know uh, a little bit about light, you know that it has a refractive index and that normally we think about refractive indexes for optical frequencies. Um, so when you're, I don't know, when you're looking at light reflected from glass, uh, sunlight, for instance, or from your um, sunglasses. But in principle, this refractive index uh, goes all the way to higher energies as well. And then what you can see is that it's, it's split into two parts. One that is to do with the absorption, so basically that's what happens here, and a part that is to do with the phase uh, of, the, of the wave, of the light that you can see. And if you, for instance, have carbon as an element and we look at this refractive index parts, then we see that the absorption for the higher energies, it gets very low. So there is indeed not much absorbed in carbon if you, if you uh, bombard it with harder x-rays. And that's why you can see through most of your body, for instance. But the phase, on the other hand, stays very strong. Um, and it's even so that if it hits, um, if this kind of light with the higher frequencies, if it, if it hits a body, the phase difference, so this phase shift, can be observed with the detector. And it's these kind of contrasts that are very sensitive to, um, to smaller samples. So whereas normally in absorption contrast, you would not see uh, a very thin sample of carbon. With the phase shift method, uh, you can see much more details. It is also reflected, as you can see, in the, um, the resolution that is offered. And therefore, this for hard x-rays is a very, very nice uh, method. This is on a beamline called MADEMAX. And as you can see, it's in quotes. And that is because this beamline is one of the ones that we would like to get, but is not here yet. Uh, and then the last way of doing it that we have currently here at, uh, at the facility is a scanning beam. So rather than putting a full field beam where you have the whole sample in your beam at the same time, you have a tiny beam and you scan across the sample. And in each point, you let the beam uh, be slightly bigger than the step size. So all of your beam spots, they overlap a little bit with each other. And that is again to, um, uh, to make use of an extra fact of this, uh, this technique, because uh, if you take one image, um, it looks very blurry, as you can see, because this is the, um, the scattered um, diffracted beam, let's say. So it doesn't tell you much, but by using the overlap between the beams, you can actually calculate uh, for the phase. And that means that you can solve the structure by using the absorption that you get here, plus the phase that you can calculate here, let's say, in a, in a nutshell. And that gives you a very high resolution uh, image of your, um, uh, of your sample. So this in principle is capable of giving you the highest resolution, but because you have to do a scanning method, it will necessarily be a bit slower. Now there are some hybrid forms of these methods available, but let's not go into this. Um, so this scanning technique for the ultimate resolution is offered on a beamline called Nanomax. And then the technique is rather called tychography. And of course, you can combine it with rotating it so that you get um, 
tomographic tocography. So now uh, a little bit about the bone. So what did, did they find out in the mouse? Well, they looked at this last couple of days of the development and they see indeed that it, uh, this is where all the action happens. So it starts from this uh, cartilage template and uh, it develops into a full um, mineralized bone, let's say, uh, where you can clearly see the uh, hydroxyapatite uh, crystals and structures forming. Uh, of course, it grows in size. It gets its final shape by, um, uh, by twisting uh, a little bit uh, for strength reasons as well. Um, and this is uh, what they see in the, um, uh, in the article. It's not very elaborate uh, how they use this technique. Uh, in principle, there are other ways of doing uh, biomedical um, imaging with, uh, especially this is phase contrast uh, uh, type. So where you can see really uh, very intricate details of your sample. So you can go from very large field of views with moderate resolution all the way down to the cell level uh, where you can get resolutions that are akin to the tychography methods. But of course, as you can see on the right hand side here, it comes at a price. So with every kind of spatial resolution that you gain, the radiation dose goes up and the sample size will go down. So um, there is much more to be, to be gained. And this is uh, one of the things why MADEMAX, uh, I think, will be uh, a great asset because it can cover all of these uh, orders of magnitudes and spatial resolution in one beam line. Um, and that is, um, for a lot of studies, I think it can be very useful. Then whilst we stay on the structure, we go a little bit more in detail and use the scattering in a different way. So we've done the tomography part and we stay at Formax to go a little bit more into SACS imaging. So SACS is small angle X-ray scattering. So again, we use the scattering, but we use it in an imaging kind of way. Um, and for this length scales, if you can see, then, um, I mean, now we are sort of going from a micron to um, a nanometer type uh, resolution. And of course, eventually you will get to get down to the, the, the single molecule levels that you, um, where you do the crystallography with a beam line like Biomax, for instance. Um, if we think about the, the SACS and WAX techniques, SACS is not really compatible with Nanomax, but WAX is. So that is one of the techniques that you will see as well, which is wide angle scattering. Um, but small angle scattering, what is it? Well, again, you place a sample in a beam and you look with a 2D detector some distance behind it. And if the sample is not a crystal, but there is some structure, some organizational aspect to it, it will give certain bright bands uh, that indicate um, where the structure is present. Uh, and we physicists, we are notorious for putting everything upside down. So rather than looking in real space, um, we like to think of it in uh, reciprocal space, but you can always calculate back to, uh, to normal space. So if, you, if we look, for instance, at the um, detector image over these two, uh, triangles and we plot it as a single line we see that there is some intensity happening here and this big bright peak that you can see is indicative uh, of um, a length scale of 65 nanometers and uh, clever people have figured out that this is indeed the spacing of gaps along the collagen fibrils that you have in bones so if you see that you know that you're uh, that you're looking at bones and that they're roughly aligned um, in a certain way so that they are, even though they are not completely lying next to each other, there is an overarching um, direction to the, uh, the fibrils. Now we can of course also plot uh, the triangles that go outward in this direction uh, and then we see a little bit of a weaker bump um, and that is to do with a different type of length scale, namely the diameter of these collagen fibers that are um, oriented in the different direction, you could say. So the diameters are organized in this way, whereas the gaps you would find in that kind of way. So by simply looking at the scattering of the sample and by summing up different parts or by looking at different directions effectively along the sample, we get some information on the structure and the organization of the sample. Now, if we want to combine that with imaging, all we basically have to do is to map it out for different directions and why not 
combine it also with rotating the sample so that we get a type of um, tomography imaging. So with the small angle scattering, we probe the, the, um, um, the periodic structure, the sort of like the, the, the level of organization. And in this particular picture that we see now from an article here, we look at a little uh, slice of a mouse brain. And you can see that by dividing the detector in all of these different uh, sectors and then summing it so that it gives you a different direction, a different color, you can visualize um, the orientation of the myelinated uh, axons in each and every point of your sample. So here, this is used as a scanning technique again. So with the beam passing through, your resolution of how fine a picture you can make, the resolution will be given by how big your beam is, and you scan it along. But in each point, the SACS pattern, so this 2D uh, detector image, will tell you what the nanoscale organization can be like, because there you have a different resolution in this Q factor, this reciprocal space, that you can relate to something in real space again. So we go back to the mouse. What did they do with scanning SACS? Well, they looked at um, these platelets that make up the fibrils, and they looked at the length, the width, and the thickness, conveniently called by their first letters. And uh, they saw the following conclusion. So the thickness is increasing, especially at the, uh, the area where everything is happening, so where the minerals mineralization is, uh, is going on strongest. Uh, the length is also increasing, and the width is actually decreasing over time. And then if you look at the organization, so again, you do this three-dimensional uh, way of looking at it. Um, and you see how organized, how structured this bone is, then you see it's not very structured actually, because I mean, the redder colors are more organization, whereas this is completely disorganized uh, crystallites. And you can see that it's only at the edges where there is some red coming up in the later stages, which is called the bone color. And the uh, orientation as well is strongest there along the load direction. And that is of course quite, um, uh, quite logical so that it's along the bone where you need the strength, but it's not super organized. It increases a little bit towards the higher to, towards the later stages of evolution, but um, but not so much uh, from beginning. So then we turn our techni uh, techniques uh, around and we use spectroscopy together with imaging. So this is again the same slide, which I should have checked because now we go through this one. But we use spectroscopy to um, to give us some, some ideas about what to look at. And this is at Nanomax, where we use uh, the small beam, so this nano-sized beam, 50 to 200 nanometers, depending on energy, and we scan the sample through the beam. And what we record is using, uh, is by using a fluorescence detector, um, we record a spectrum in each and every uh, point. And the spectrum, this fluorescence is a property of the atoms that are um, in the sample. So it means that both the energy at which a peak occurs plus the probability of, of uh, this process occurring is entirely governed by the atom. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of sample it sits in. It's a very physics kind of property, you could say. So effectively what it gives you is what is where in your sample. And if you do this for all of the, uh, the points, so be behind each point, there is an entire spectrum. But then, of course, you can filter out and you say like, OK, I want to look only at the iron over my entire sample. And you can plot that out or the sulfur or the uh, calcium or whatever. So it's a very easy way of in each point getting all of the elements that are present. And the spatial resolution of the picture that you make is ultimately dependent on the spot, uh, spot size of the beam. So like SACS, the real, uh, the real space resolution is determined by the spot size. Okay, for the bone, they've uh, looked at, again, this little fragment, uh, a little slice of bone. And here is the mineralization front. And they see that away from it, so in the, the youngest, uh, not even basically, you can call it bone, but it's still uh, mostly collagen, what happens there is that you see a lot of zinc uh, and the calcium only comes on later. And where it's a bit more yellow, there is an overlap of these, uh, these elements. So it is very interesting to see that the zinc is basically a precursor um, for the mineralization to occur. 
So if we zoom in on these smaller areas, uh, and we do that for the week before, or the, sorry, the day before uh, this stage, you can see even individual cells with their nuclei uh, forming, and it's, uh, the calcium here is very pronounced because it's on a logarithmic scale, whereas here it's given together with the zinc again, and you can see that the zinc uh, and the calcium in these newer regions is very much uh, located outside of the cells, actually, in the intercellular um, matrix. So they've, they've summarized that in a couple of plots for the evolution uh, in the different stages. And uh, here in blue, it is, for instance, this uh, slightly riper bone, you could say, where uh, the calcium content is increasing only towards the end. They also had an adult um, uh, control mouse. And at the, um, the proliferative zone, so this area where the, the zinc and um, um, calcium overlap, they see that this ratio of the uh, intracellular to extracellular calcium, it, uh, it falls abruptly towards the later stages of development. Um, and then in the already formed bone, the funny thing is as well that the calcium uh, still, so the really uh, most mature parts of bone, uh, the calcium is, is increasing quite rapidly. Whereas with the, um, the mineralization front there, it is slightly, oh, sorry, the um, slightly riper parts of the mineralization uh, sites, they are following the calcium content of the, um, the right bone. Um, and then an interesting thing is also to compare the calcium intensity that we get from the X-ray fluorescence with the SACS intensity that gives you um, the structure, how much of it is structured, you could say, otherwise it doesn't give much of a signal. And you can see that in these areas with the asterisks, there is some calcium present, whereas there's no SACS signal. So that basically infer to them that there is uh, non-ordered calcium deposits outside of the uh, organized uh, bone hydroxyapatite, which are precursors. Right, then a little sidestep to uh, Softimax. Uh, this was not part of the article, but they use uh, a dental implant um, in a, instead to look at, so it is still bone. And this dental implant is looked at after 47 months uh, of being uh, inside uh, a person. Um, what we need for Softimax, which is a soft X-ray beamline, uh, and uh, keep that in mind, for anything that is called soft, you need thin samples. So five micron or below, and depending on the edge, it can be as thin as 100 nanometers. What we do here is a technique that is called scanning transmission X-ray microscopy which means that we look uh, at a sample with a small beam, beam and we scan it, that's the S. We look at the transmission signal, basically at the absorption, but as you may be really absorption contrast is a bit more um, important than the phases, let's say. And we combine that with measuring over an absorption edge of an element that we consider that it might be important in that particular sample. So here they've done an image over nitrogen edge, which is around 400 EV. Uh, and with this beam, where you go beam spot, um, you scan through the sample, and in each sample you collect the intensity, and you can plot these as curves, and you can group the curves where you say, hey, there's a very, very uh, strong signal around the nitrogen edge. There, uh, you can plot those in the same color, and you can do it again for different parts of the sample. So here is the bone, this is the implant. Uh, and you can map that out. So you can see that there is a, a strong, uh, nitrogen signal as part of the implant uh, and not so much in the bone. Now they've also looked at the more obvious edges of calcium and titanium which the, uh, the implant is made of and they can even here they can distinguish different uh, types of uh, calcium so that most of the calcium has the same profile as hydroxyapatite as you would expect but it's a little bit more amorphous so the um, the pre-peaks change a little bit when you get close to the interface. It's not, um, it's not as uh, nice. Um, and some titanium has migrated into the, into the bone. So this is uh, just to show you that also at Softimax, at a soft X-ray beamline, we can look at uh, biological samples, but this was not part of the, um, the original thing. Right, um, I will spe speed up very quickly through um, IR microscopy which is another beamline that is not yet uh, with us, but we hope to have. 
Here we look at molecular chemistry. So the signatures that you would get from, um, from IR are a spectrum that is indicative of the different molecules or the different vibrations that you can have in a molecule, which are very well tabulated for many things. So for bone, for instance, the one that is important is a phosphate at 1060. And even if you look into detail, you can uh, look at the, the shoulders on this phosphate to determine the structure or the aging, the maturity of the bone, as they did here. So when this uh, ratio of um, 1096 and 1127, when it starts to decrease, um, it means that um, the bone is maturing. So, and the other one that is important is a peak that is a little bit lower in wave number, and that is a collagen peak. So, for the mouse, where does it uh, leave us? Well, um, there's of course an increase of mineral content all around. The collagen decreases over time um, with these development stages, and um, it increases actually in the um, in the bone color, which is the outer rim of it, which is quite surprising to me, at least. Um, and the, the ratio of mineral to collagen, so these two peaks, 1060 um, and something, something I can't remember, for the collagen, um, they, of course, uh, it increases. So the mineral part is, is getting stronger as the collagen uh, drops away. Um, and the maturing of the bone is also seen, so that this, this ratio that um, increases, that in, indicates the matu maturity of the bone is also increasing. So that's it for the mouse, um, and that's also almost it for my talk. Um, so I leave you with a couple of slides on summarizing this. So we have seen a number of beamlines, and I've also glossed over a couple of other ones that are not so um, bio-relevant, let's say. But this is to give you an idea of the kind of energy scales that these beamlines would work on. And here at the bottom, I have also given you the kind of spatial resolutions that these beamlines could offer and what you can hope to see with it, more or less. Right, um, and then if you say like, okay, so now how do I get to an experiment? Um, then think about what you want. So what is your question? Um, and then see, is there a specific resolution that comes with it? So a specific size that I need to be able to see? Uh, what kind of information do I need? So what kind of contract, uh, contrast mechanism uh, do I need? Do I need scattering? So I need to look at the structure or do I need chemistry? Uh, and from there on end, of course, there's many, many questions about the acceptable radiation dose, the sample preparation um, and possible combinations of techniques like the mouse paper. And for that, it's best always to contact us. So here again is this dose versus resolution. The higher the resolution you want, uh, the higher the dose, um, unfortunately. So that's a little bit of a, of a downer, of course. But uh, a lot of it you can uh, at least circumvent to a certain stage by uh, cryocooling the sample, for instance. And there, I think other synchrotrons are a little bit ahead of us, but we are working to implement it in, the, in our beamlines as well. Right, then this is the final slide. Um, and I would like to say thank you to the people that have provided me with slides over the, um, uh, over the past couple of years and uh, for the techniques or beam lines uh, that I've spoken about. Uh, a shout out also to the people of the paper. And funnily enough, in the paper itself, um, there is um, a heads up to the predecessor of HALOS. So um, you see what it can lead to. And with that, I stop. So hopefully uh, you've known a little bit more now. <laughs>